So, Everest, this incredible mountain. Everest is the modern midlife crisis for the wealthy executive. So, it's not impossible, it's very possible. And the more money you spend, the more possible it becomes. Where does that leave us? What does that mean for people who are trying to be at the forefront? If the things you achieved 10 years, 20 years ago are now irrelevant because everybody's doing them. Where do you go looking for your new impossible? So in our case, we go looking for things that have never been done before. And here's one example. The Mizeno Ridge of Nangaparbat, the longest unclimbed ridge in the high Himalaya. But Nangaparbat, like Everest, was first climbed 50, 60, 65 years ago. If it hasn't been done in an entire lifetime, you do have to ask, what's the problem? So, what's the problem? It's Nangaparbat. It's the ninth highest in the world, and it has a death rate, death to summit rate, of about 22%. That puts it up there with K2 as one of the most dangerous mountains in the world. The ridge itself, eight peaks to cross, nine kilometers long, at 7,000 meters. Now, people have tried it. 11 teams over 35 years. And this is as far as anybody has ever got. The first thing we want to know is what do we know about this problem? Start with our team. Two members of our team have been there before, back in the 1990s. And they got as far as there, and then they took this photograph along the ridge. Yes, they took that photograph, turned round, and went home. A number of years later, two mad Americans turn up, and they just take off along the ridge. By the time they reach the end of the ridge, they're out of food and out of water, they've got altitude sickness, they're exhausted, they descend. But there's a lot of useful information in this attempt. The ridge can be climbed. The biggest problem is moving fast enough and carrying enough supplies to last for long enough. We decide to pick a slightly bigger team than the Americans, pick a group of six, and try and bring into it two very different kinds of expertise to balance out these different problems. We have three Western climbers who have experience climbing all the way around the world. They've done new routes, unclimbed mountains. And three Sherpa climbers whose experience is largely from the likes of Everest and a couple of the other big Nepalese mountains, but are incredibly strong, experienced climbers. And we hope that that gives us the expertise to find the route and the strength to last on the route for long enough to finish it. So, you've done all of this investigation. What does the challenge involve? What's gone wrong before? How do we solve those problems? Now we need to test all this theory on the mountainside. We're acclimatizing to the altitude, but we are also finding out what is this year like? This snowpack, these weather conditions, this equipment we've chosen to bring, how is it performing? This is our chance to do literally in the field testing of all of these ideas. And then take all that information, pull it back down to base camp, and start to come up with our final choices. Because at the heart of this problem lies alpine style. Everything has to go in a rucksack. Take your big rucksack, tent, 
sleeping bag, sleeping mat, uh, stove, satellite phone, batteries, uh, cameras, medical kit. And there's a certain amount of space left that needs to take food and gas. The point about gas, there's no water. It's frozen. Gas melts snow to give you water. Every extra gram of food, every extra gram of gas means you last a little bit longer. It also makes your rucksack a little bit heavier. 10 days. 10 days of food is what we can put in the rucksacks and still lift them. 10 days. This is the plan. Like all good plans written on the back of an envelope. Six days to the top, two days to get down, two days in reserve. And the final thing we need to know before we start is what is the failure strategy. Because this is not the sort of speech where I stand here and proclaim that winners never quit. And that if you believe it, you can do it. It's not true. If this is genuinely that difficult, failure is absolutely an option. And you need to fail safely. We have two goals. Get to the summit, come home alive. Let's just think about what coming home alive might have to look like. If we fail early on, back the way we've come. Once we're on the knife edge ridge, you can't get back. If we fail anywhere along the ridge, we've got to get to where the Americans went down. If we get anywhere close to the summit, then we go down the Kinshofa route. We have to get to one of those three exit points. And finally, you have to stop planning. It's time to climb. Day one. And yes, the snow turns out to be deep and soft. And sometimes we are trying to dig a thigh deep trench through snow. But the Sherpas are just machines for breaking trail in snow. And the weather isn't great, and the mist comes in in the afternoons, which makes the navigation tricky. So we're slower than we'd like to be. And the third big challenge that we almost never give enough weight to is the background admin. Because you only climb for eight or 10 hours a day. As soon as you stop, you have to dig platforms for the tents, up go the tents, bags of snow, a liter of snow will melt down to one cup of water. Hours of work melting snow. And then in tents the size, half the size of a double bed, two of you in there, you need to melt water, eat food, repair equipment, dry clothing, and in this tiny claustrophobic space, try and sleep. It's so cold that your breath will condense overnight and freeze inside the tent. You'll wake up to your own little snowstorm of your frozen breath onto your sleeping bag. And you'll shovel all that damp equipment back into your rucksack in the morning because there's no time to spare. You don't get to sit in the sun while it all dries out. And then you get to climb again for the next eight or 10 hour day. So by day four, we're possibly a little slow. It's a long way to that summit still. And this is where we run into the problems we didn't expect. The strongest of the Sherpas, Nuru, is in front. He's trying to keep us on the knife edge ridge and he needs to get past that rock and back up to the ridge. And as he tries to do it, he falls 25 meters down the side of the mountain. He's caught by the safety rope. We're tied together in pairs, but he can't get back up. The snow is like packed sugar. As soon as you put your weight on it, it breaks. He can't get back up. 
We're on this knife edge ridge, held apart by the safety ropes, difficult to get together to try and pull him back up. We're running out of time. We are getting cold because the only way to stay warm is to move. And we're stuck. We need to do something. What can we do? Our choices basically look like this. We can climb down to him and go round or we can keep on trying to pull him back up. We're going to choose to climb down. Try and break the deadlock by going down. And what we're trying to do is get round to the next place we can put up tents and camp. The trouble is we've lost too much time. By the time it gets dark, we've only got to hear it's a 75 degree slope. It is not easy to put a tent up on a 75 degree slope. So one tent half up. Two of our team actually dig a hole in the snow to sleep in. And two of them end up simply sitting there through the night at 7,000 meters. This is not a good way to spend 12 hours of your life. So cold, the stoves aren't working properly, we're not eating, we're not drinking, we're not sleeping. When the sun finally rises, we stagger out of our holes, climb across the mountain. As soon as we get to that call, we pitch the tents, drink, eat, and then go to sleep. We've just lost an entire day based on that one decision. And then we run straight into the next problem. And this one is actually about data. In the old days, you wanted to know what the weather was like on your mountain, you looked out of your tent door. Now, of course, we have satellite weather reports coming in by text message on our phone. But we've got very limited contact. These tents do not come with plug points. There is no way to recharge the satellite phone. So limited usage. We know there's a storm coming tomorrow. We also know it's been getting weaker on the forecast for the last few days. So maybe it's coming, maybe it isn't. We look out of the tent door and we see this, the Twin Peaks. There is nowhere up there to safely camp. We can't see how far we have to go before we get to another campsite. Should we risk climbing through a storm without knowing how far we have to go? We're going to stay safe. We're going to wait. And we are going to end up waiting for a storm that never comes. But there's an interesting truth to these kinds of decisions. We're trying so hard to be objective, but we do tend to be overshadowed by the last thing that went wrong. We're busy solving the problem behind us instead of thinking about what is the most likely problem ahead of us. We are running out of time. Day eight. Keep on climbing. Get to the start of the pinnacles. We know from the Americans that this is the most difficult part of the ridge. It doesn't look very difficult. You know, the Americans must have been tired by now, really, because we desperately don't want it to be very difficult. And it's very difficult. It takes us 11 hours of non-stop climbing. It's this mix of towers that we have to climb over, down, across. Between the towers are these knife edge ridges of snow. And then it's up the next one. It's a maze. 11 hours without a break to get to the end of the ridge. This is as far as any team has ever got. It's also nine days into a 10-day plan. And we still need two days to get down again. 
we are tired, desperately tired. That day through the pinnacles was just mentally, physically exhausting. We need one more day to set the high camp and then one huge 18-hour climbing day to try and get to the summit. Day 10, keep on climbing. Put in the high camp, possibly a little lower than we should. The high camp is where you get to dump the tent and the sleeping bag, so we're quite keen to get rid of that extra weight. The thing is, you start climbing at midnight, 18 hours, climb in the dark early. That means you get almost no sleep before you start. So you go straight into your next cycle of climbing. Pitch dark, bitterly cold, howling wind. Uh, Nuru, the strongest of the Sherpas, racing up the mountainside. And the Sherpas are quite keen to be done at this point. <laughs> Everybody's quite keen to be done. So we're kind of chasing Nuru's head torch up the mountainside in the darkness. And there's a moment on mountains when the sun rises. If it rises behind you, your mountain ends up throwing this extraordinary shadow that runs out over hundreds of miles of Pakistan. And we are clambering up onto a summit at that moment. It's extraordinarily beautiful, the sight. The trouble is, it's not the right summit. <laughs> because we've gone straight up in the darkness, which is all very well, but the summit is actually well off to one side. And it might have been more sensible to go sideways on the snow lower down because now we're trying to go sideways across all this rock. It's slow, it's technical, and eventually we hit a rock wall that we cannot climb. We have to retreat. 18 hours of climbing to achieve absolutely nothing. We've wasted another day, we've eaten the last of the food, and we're back at the high camp. And honestly, why? Why does a team with this experience and this preparation end up in this position? And I think there are a couple of interesting things here that aren't about mountains. Let's come back to that question about who are the better climbers, the Sherpas or the Westerners? Because what we essentially have are two silos of expertise, two groups. The Sherpas are obviously massively physically strong. It's in your face expertise. But they're used to being on Everest with that fixed line. There's no unknowns. You know, there's no question about where does the route go. The Sherpas have been racing ahead, just taking the obvious let's go up line. And the Westerners, who are supposed to have the strategic overview about finding the right way in unknown ground, are so busy trying to keep up that they aren't doing the strategic planning. We need a much better integration between our two types of expertise and more recognition of the value of strategy. So, What's that about? It's about communication. We're a team of six. Seriously, how hard is it to communicate when there are six of you? Surprisingly hard. When we're climbing, separated by the safety rope, four layers of clothing over my ears. I can't talk to you unless I'm standing next to you shouting at you. OK, we get to camp. Immediately, we're in these tiny two-man tents with hours of work to do. We are siloed in the camps. There is no moment in the day when the six of us can sit together and have an intelligent, considered discussion. 
about what we're seeing on the mountain and what that means for our strategy. Sensible choices about minimizing weight, but they have consequences for communication. Which leads to our third mistake. When you are stressed and frightened and tired, if you've got your head down, just trying to keep up with today's urgent tasks, if you're following the plan, you must be doing the right thing. So we're just trying to execute the plan. But this has never been done before. The plan isn't a map. It's just our best hope. Reality has been quietly wandering off over here. And we're busy following the plan. We have not been flexible about changing the plan to reflect what's actually happening on, as the project unfolds. So, crisis. The plan gets thrown out of the tent door, and we have to start again. Day 12. There is no food left. It's going to take two days to get down. We are going to split the team. So, what does that look like? Who's going to go down, and who's going to stay? I'm going to go down, because I'm a big believer in living to climb another day. And the Sherpas are going to go down, because they have had enough of this. And we will get down. It will take two days and involve an avalanche and a broken ankle, but we'll get down. Those are the two strongest members of our team. At this point, it's about lifelong expertise and bone-deep commitment to the project. Six o'clock on day 14 on the 10-day plan, and they've done it. But what interests me is why we weren't better, why we didn't get all six to the top. And it's because we made mistakes. I don't think it's actually possible to make no mistakes, particularly doing something that's never been done before. It's just so impossible to know all the ways that it might go wrong. But those mistakes were essentially about us as people. It was about never having fully integrated the different kinds of expertise in the group, making sure they were equally weighted and equally valued. It was about not recognizing the way in which choices impeded communication, and what the consequences of that might be. Thinking beforehand about how to facilitate good communication. And it was about that very human tendency to cling to the plan, the certainty of the plan, instead of embracing the uncertainty of the challenge the ability to have a flexible path while still having a focused outcome. And all we can do is take those lessons and move them forward onto the next project. And yes, hopefully we won't make the same mistakes and we will discover new ones. That's how it works. But every project lets us move forward to something that much more ambitious because we're that much more confident in our skill and our experience, in our mindset as pioneers in the mountains. Because I can promise you two things, absolutely. The one is, it's going to be more difficult than you wished. It's going to take longer than you hoped. But it can be done. And the other one, if nothing else, you don't need to eat nearly as much food as you think you do. Thank you.